God, we thank you so much for this amazing time to be in your presence, to be with your people, to hold space for your people. Lord, we came to hear a word that will give us insight, perspective, transformation on how we can experience the life that is before us, the life that we live. God, as you bless us here at Relevant, I ask that you bless all the other churches that preach your word, that speak your word, that live your word. Lord, we lift up the Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, Calvary Chapel. Lord, we lift up Sandals Church, Harvest Christian Fellowship, the Grove Community Church, City Church, Elevate Life Church, River of Life Church. Lord, all the different diversities and bodies and churches that are meeting in garages, churches that are meeting on the, on the corner of the street. Lord, lift up Set Free Ministries. God, thank you that we are a part of your living, vibrant, powerful, advancing church. Yes. Lord, if there may be any who would hear your word today and in the days to come, may they come to a loving relationship with you by confessing your name and believing in their heart that you are Lord. In Jesus' name, and everyone shouts, amen. 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 So we've been on this series called Back at One, and the question has been, as we start out this new year, how do we bounce back? How do we uh, uh, get back all the things that were canceled? How do we activate and start our lives again? How do we navigate this new season that God's taking us in? I mean, we, we are in the age of everything has changed. The algorithm of this planet has shifted and nothing is the same. We don't even know what normal is going to look like again, if normal will ever come back. But I believe that God has a word and a perspective and a way for us to experience, to see life, and to get in line with what he is doing on this planet. Can I get an amen? The question becomes, how can God bless how can God uh, uh, bless through me? How can God bless me? How can God uh, 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 allow me to be powerful in his kingdom? Last week we looked at Matthew chapter 18, and in Matthew chapter 18, the disciples come to Jesus and they ask a question that I'm pretty sure every single person has asked this question. Uh, uh, and the question, in one way or another, they've asked, you've asked this question. They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus says, unless you turn, unless you change and become like a child, you will not see the kingdom of God. Unless you change, unless you turn and become like a child, you will not see, you will not enter. You won't get close to the kingdom of God. Become a child is what he tells them. And we explored what that, that means. What does it mean to be a child? And, and for some people, being a child means uh, become innocent, become uh, full of wonder. And, and what I submitted to you as, as, as an example or, or, or an understanding or perspective is that being a child is being willing to take risks is being willing to, to literally give up yesterday's defeats in order to try something new today. I shared with you, I mean, like a child, I mean, how many times do they try to walk? How many times do they, they get up again and say, you know what, I fell down, I bumped my head, I scratched myself up, but you know what, I'm going to do it again. And then you become an adult and you try something one time. You give a half step uh, uh, attempt at something and you're like, oh, no, it didn't work. Oh, my God, that hurt. I'm not going to do it again. You, you, you try a relationship and it, and it doesn't work out. And, and all of a sudden, oh, my God, oh, my God, all men are jerks. All men are jerks. All women are, are, are this way. All, all people from San Bernardino behave this way. It, it's, it's like you, you have these things that you, you have a, a very minuscule, small um, uh, experience of, and you completely do an about face and never go there again. And children, they'll go and go and go and go until they can't go anymore. Then the next day they'll get up and they'll go again. I, I, we took our kids up to uh, Lake Arrowhead uh, to Santa's Village, and we, we took them uh, ice skating, uh, very Canadian. My wife's Canadian. She was all pumped about it. She was like, oh, they can go ice skating. I'm like, baby, I'm for, I was born in Zimbabwe. 
In Zimbabwe, you've, you have never heard of the Olympic team from Zimbabwe that's ice skating or... We don't do that stuff. They have more of my DNA strong in them. I said, no, we'll do ice skating. And my kids were like, yeah, we want to go ice skating. I said, like, you do not know what you're speaking of. We took him ice skating, and sure enough, Jazz kept falling. Boom. He gets back up. I'm going to do it again. How do it? I can do it. Boom. Boom. Over and over again. Just like over. And he kept getting up. I'm doing it. Boom. <laughs> And, and, and you know what the thing about it is when you know your child has hurt themselves, you know, you know it hurt. And they're, just, they're like, <laughs> they have that goofy face like, they really hurt, but I want to have fun. That's what Jesus was talking about. Become a child. Go for it again. Be willing to give up, to die to yesterday's understanding in order to experience something new. Have a mindset that, that's going to go into something completely new with a clean slate. And here's the thing about children. Children, if you're taking notes, write this down. Children don't approach opportunity with conditions. Children don't approach opportunities with conditions and therefore... And therefore, they're blessed unconditionally. Are you with me? Children don't approach an opportunity like, I'm only going to do this if it doesn't hurt. I'm only going to attempt this if it's, if it's guaranteed that it's going to work on the first time. They approach from a perspective of, I'm just going to go for it. Are you with me? They don't take special terms for them to agree to try something new. They just go for it. And the real reason that you and I as adults miss God is because we are right about everything. We are right about our experiences. We are right about our, our, our perspective. We are right about our thinking. We miss God because we are so focused on being right. Are you with me? We're so focused on being, our, our experience is right, our, our perspective is right, our thinking is right, our knowledge on the matter is right, our data from, from, from all the things that we've tried is right. I was driving over here uh, th uh, this afternoon just to, to come to uh, this worship experience, and as I got in my car, um, uh, my, my GPS appeared on, on, on my dash, and it said, you're heading to a place that's near Van Buren Boulevard. You're three minutes away. And I was like, how do you know I'm going there? And obviously, the algorithm on my Apple phone knows that right around 4.30 on Sunday afternoons, Jonathan Belima goes to this address and is there for about an hour or so. And then, without fail, when I leave this place, you know what my GPS is going to say? You're going to Mission Grove. You're going to Mission Grove Plaza to a place called Grapau. In the morning, right around 8, 8, 8 o'clock, 7.50, it'll say, you're going to, Wood, to, to Woodcrest Christian Day School to drop off your child. It's like I don't have to program it in there. The algorithm has, has had an experience, and so my phone now dictates what's going to happen. Even if I try to switch things up, it's going to be like, oh, what are you doing? That is how your brain behaves. Your brain now says, oh, this is how he's going to re respond to this situation. This is how he's going to um, uh, approach this, this conversation. Oh, he, he saw that look from, from that person. Oh, this is what that means about this. And, and, and it could be that it's completely different, that there's something new happening in you, around you, but because you're so focused on being right and your mind wants to only validate the things that have happened in the past, You go and walk along the well-beaten paths of your past mistakes, past failures. And God's like, hey, I'm doing something new. 
Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Why are you living like this old person, the old busted, disgusted version of you? Let me tell you something. You would have never heard of Joshua. You would have never heard of Joshua had he not given up his understanding of might and strength in military battle. When, when God said, get rid of all the men and go into battle with 300. What do you mean? That's not how we win battles. Are you with me? You'd have never heard of Abraham had, 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 had he not literally just believed God instead of believed his well-beaten path and the GPS of his mind. What do you mean go to a place that I do not know? And in order for him to experience what God was going to do, he had to give up yesterday's understanding of how things work. You'd have never heard of of Isaac. Are you with me? You'd have never heard of Jeremiah if when God approached the prophet Jeremiah and said, I want you to go and preach to the nations. And Jeremiah said, I can't do it because I'm too young. And all the preachers and the pastors and the prophets I know are old, ugly, and they smell bad, and I'm not there yet. That's how I thought about preachers. They're old. They've got bad kids. Because I was... A bad kid. Amen. <laughs> You'd have never heard of him. The Bible says, Behold, I'm doing a what? A new thing. Behold, I'm doing a new thing, but we are stuck in our old ways. So we're going back to one. Amen? Amen. We're going back to one. And going back to one is embracing that his ways are not my ways. Going back to one is what? fully embracing that his ways are not my ways. What would your life look like if you approached every situation like God's doing something and this does not make sense, but I'm going to step into it in faith, now knowing that if he's called me to it, he'll bring me through it, and, and that every step that I take in faith will land. Most of the time, like, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know if this is going to work. I, 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 I heard, I, Uncle Jerry tried this, and it didn't work. I was, I was, I was on, a, on a call with a, um, uh, with a uh, business con- consultant, and, <laughs> and we were just kind of discussing, like, you know, what we see in, in, in our industry and in our work. And here's something that's, like, it's going to sound so counterintuitive. Um, If you're starting a business, don't listen to your family who've never started businesses. Because they won't know how to encourage that. I saw, I saw a meme today. I literally saw a meme about a rapper in Detroit who has sold over a million dollars worth of records, but he's still working at UPS. And they're recommending him for it. And I was like, that's cool. Good work ethic. But you're forsaking the opportunity that's in front of you because everyone in your family says stay at your job. And I'm not talking about, do not take that as like, oh, pastor said I can leave my job. No, 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 that's, that's, that's not faith. That's foolishness and presumption. But sometimes we, we get into these spaces where we're like, oh, I, I, I want to go back, I want to go to school, I want to pursue a, a, a master's degree or a bachelor's degree or, or a, a, a post, a, a doctoral degree, and, and you're looking for encouragement from people who've never experienced that. And they're like, no, 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 you should take it easy. You should, you know, slow down a little bit. I don't know, this workload is too hard for you. Go to talk to somebody who's gone through it, and they'll be like, yo, you can do this. It's going to be hard. It's going to be grinding. But guess what? That's how you get it done. You need balance. You know, oh, man. Going there. Send me an email. Be mad at me. I'm not saying this from the spirit of, of judgment. Balance is for broke people. Kobe Bryant was never balanced. He got up early and took how many shots before the game? 
Michael Jordan took how many? I mean, you, you think about all those who did something amazing. They did not live a life of, oh, when I get home, I, I drink a beer, and then I just sit and watch The Simpsons, and I'm just like, you know, it was, it was just a hard day. No, they get back home, and they go practice again. They go grind again. Are you with me? If I'm stepping on your toe, just don't say anything. That was your moment to say, amen. (laughs) If you want to embrace everything that God has for you, you have to abandon your ways and fully embrace that his way is not your way and it's not your mama's way. So the Bible says this. The Bible says, many are called, but few are Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are what? But few are chosen. Now, now, now there's, there's many different applications for that, and, 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 and you could take that so many different ways. But for this teaching, I want you to understand that when it comes to God wanting to release blessing through your life, release blessing in your life, and have you be someone who's powerful in the kingdom of God, many are called. But very few are chosen. I had an argument with a friend of mine on on Friday. And and, and my argument to him was this, was that the 12 disciples that you hear about were not the only people that Jesus called. Those are the ones that made it. There are probably many other guys that just failed the test. They were called, but only a few were chosen. So there's there's about five, five principles that we're going to look at in, in Luke chapter 5, I'm going to read the passage, that I want you to fully see something about how God does something, how, how the individuals that God uses to do something powerful through, that, to give an opportunity of a lifetime to, are people who pass a certain type of test in order to be chosen, in order for blessing to be released in and through them. Luke chapter 5. You're like, oh my gosh, I thought he was halfway over. I'm not. That was just the intro. (laughs) On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats. How many? Two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Okay, I'll pause there real quick because... So you get some context. Fishing in this context was a night job. The fishermen had been fishing all night. And now their shift was over. They've been toiling. They've been working. They've been grinding. And now the job is over and they're washing their nets. And the the washing of the nets is a grueling task because they have to wash them in a way so that the nets are sturdy enough to go back and try again the next day. And if they don't do it, it it can be very complicated for them. And so so, so Jesus is is, is teaching the crowd and he's doing his thing. And, And up to this point, Jesus has already gone to the synagogue and he's already declared that the Spirit of the Lord is a is upon me to to preach the gospel and 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 he's healed so many people already. His ministry is is in full swing. You know what? Jesus didn't need anybody. But he was like, I got to build a team. I got I to gotta have some people with me to, 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 to allow this blessing to reach the nations through. Are you with me? And so he says, he, 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 he gets to the, the, the seashore, the beach, and, and just for somebody out there, I, I, I believe that God is trying to tell us that good ministry takes place on the beach. Amen. Amen. And Jesus likes to preach on boats, so church, buy your pastor a yacht. Just kidding. (laughs) That was a joke, okay. (laughs) Lord, have mercy. The spirit of the building, come on. (laughs) The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Verse 3, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Peter, He asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Hmm. They're discouraged. They're tired. It's been a long night of nothing. 
How many fish have they caught? Nada. They got nothing. Most of us work jobs where we don't consider the profit and loss of the company that we're working for in order to get our paycheck. As long as I clocked in on Friday next week, they'll be paying me. That's not how that world worked. It was one where if you didn't catch anything that day, you didn't get a paycheck. I remember um, uh, back in the day, I, I, I sold um, a water filters door to door. One of, one of my many hustles. And I was like, I'm going to sell these water filters. And if I can only get one sale, that would be a $1,000 commission for me. Jazz? Knocked on doors and nothing. And I had knocked on the next door, nothing. And it's eight hours of knocking on doors, and guess what? Nothing. I went home and I told my dad about this. He's like, son, you're, no, this is how he said it. You, you, are, you are so weak. When I used to do, go door to door, I would take a bus to a different town, and I had no money in my pocket. The only way I was going to go back home to sleep was if I made a sale. If I didn't make a sale, I was in trouble. I was like, man, praise the Lord, I live in America. <laughs> if you didn't perform, it was done. The fish was their check for the day, and they made no money that day. They had no success that day. After a long night of nothing, do you think that these guys are in the mood to hear somebody preaching about anything? After a long night of toiling, fruitless labor, and then this, this rabbi guy who, who, who you know, you've seen him speak, and he, and he makes some good points. He, he, he just, he, he doesn't even ask. He doesn't even ask. He, it says that getting into the boat, he stands there. He's like, hey, man, can you go out a little bit? You want me to go back to where I failed? You want me to go back? You, you, don't you see that I, I've been out there already? I, I, I'm tired. Jesus, I'm tired. It's been a long night. It's been a hard night. And you're now, and I'm washing the nets. I've got a job to do. Right now, the only thing that's on my mind is sleep. He gets in the boat and says, can we go out into the water some, again? Question for you is, what do you do? What do you do? Write this down. What do you do when opportunity gets into your boat? And tells you to go out again. To go try again. What, what do you do when opportunity gets into your boat? And the thing about it is this. Write this down. Your greatest life-changing opportunities come as uninvited interruptions. The greatest opportunities of your life will come as, a, as an uninvited interruption when you are at your wit's end and you don't want to try again. You don't want to do anything again. You're completely tired. You're, you're like, ah, the, why does this have to happen? I have found out in my life that when I don't want to go on anymore, God shows up. He's like, you ready? Are you ready? Let's, let's do something. Now that you've, you've expended all your energy, let's try my energy. It says, getting into the boat, where were we? Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he, I, I love how Luke even just puts it. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> after, after working all night, Kevin, he gets in the boat, goes out a little, and Jesus sits down. Oh, this is going to take a while. Really? You're going to give one of your real exegetical messages? You're about to start teaching? I was hoping you just get in here and stand so you can just exhort the people a little bit. Like, go with God. Try harder. Your best life, you're the best is yet to come. But no, Jesus sits down. <clears throat> 
you may have heard it said. Right? He says he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Can you imagine Peter's countenance? Come on, camera zoom in real quick. Peter ain't even taking notes at this point. He's just, just kind of like, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I, I, I hate fish. I hate boats. As a matter of fact, I'm reconsidering my religion right now. I don't know about this Judaism thing. Maybe we should pray to the fish god. Sitting down in my boat. Why didn't he go to the Zebedee brothers and sit in their boats? What, what, what is it about me? Do I look non-threatening? That he feels as if he could just walk into my boat and in front of all the... It was probably even like one of those pressure moments where all these people are watching. They're like, um, uh, can you go out a little bit? If, you, if they weren't here, you'd have heard... No! Yes. And Jesus sits down and, and he's teaching the people. And when he had finished, Peter's like, all right, we're done, right? And when he had finished, when he had finished... <laughs> Speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. Nothing! I am a fisherman, you are a carpenter from Nazareth. We took nothing. We get the Cliff Notes version. Test number one. You ready for it? The first test to be chosen for blessing to be released in you and through you. Are you ready for it? The doing it when you don't feel like it test. The doing it when you don't feel like it test. There's nothing that indicates that Peter, Simon Peter, wanted to do this. It was a long, the way that the writer describes, it was after a long night of toil. They're doing it when you don't feel like it, test. Second test is the trust now and understand later test. He says, go out, put out into the deep, and let down your nets for a catch. Let down your nets for a catch. Now, now here's the thing about it. The way that Jesus uh, works with his disciples, the ones that are, were going to carry this gospel into the ends of the world, is that he, he, he's constantly presenting them with scenarios that require them to trust now and understand later. Align with his word now and get the details of why later on. But in our generation, I'm not going to do anything until, unless I have a guarantee, unless I understand. I, I mean, like, oh, what, how am I going to go forward with this if I don't, if I don't know the details? I, I need to have a YouTube tutorial on how this is going to work out in my life. I need to have my research. I need to understand. Show me your source material that, that, that makes it so that if I go out in the deep again, don't you know that I've been fishing in this lake for years, Jesus, years. And I've heard a legend that every 40 years or so, the fish leave the lake. And that's what happened last night. There's no fish. We went all over and caught nothing. We didn't see anything. It's not going to work. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Just go out in the deep and, and, and cast your nets one more time. The fish don't show up during the day, Jesus. That's why we go at night. We go at night because the fish have eyes and they see Jewish men who are trying to catch them. And you want us to go out there in plain sight where they can see us? Of course they're going to run. This is not making any sense. Here's the thing about it. God is okay with your dialogue as long as it ends to ultimate obedience on your part. 
You can have a discussion. I mean, there's plenty of places in Scripture where you see men having discussions. Well, God, God, wait, if, there, if there's 20 faithful people there, will you still destroy the city? Uh, okay, fine. I'll, I'll humor you. I love God. He'll, he'll, he'll have a conversation with you. But don't ever let your conversation talk you out of your blessing. You remember the feeding of the 5,000? One of my favorite stories, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus has been preaching for a long time. It's been all day. And the disciples are like, the people are hungry. We're hungry. You know the sons of thunder have temper tantrums every now and then. Peter cusses out people. We don't got no Snickers bars to, to calm them down. And everybody's just kind of like, oh, we're on edge. Like, this guy is going on way too long. This is... This, it's good, but it's not that good. We need to eat. We need to send these people away. And so, like, you know, go, t- go tell them that. Don't, don't tell them that we're the ones who are hungry. Tell Jesus that the people, he cares about the people. He doesn't care about those of us who serve in his ministry. Tell him it's the people. <clears throat> Jesus, um, some of the people are hungry, and we're in a very, uh, we're far away. In and out is not, a, it's not close by at all. Maybe we should wrap this up. Send them away. And Jesus, Jesus is so cool. He's like, uh, you give them something to eat. <sighs> what, what did he say? He said, we got to give them something to eat. I don't feel as if we're being supported by our leader. <laughs> He's not providing the resources that we need in order to make this thing happen. I mean, like, what kind of leader tells you to do something, but they don't ever give you the resource material as how to make it happen? <sighs> okay, I, I, I have an idea. This is going to mess him up. I'm, I saw a little boy with a carryout. I'm going to go grab his lunch. So Andrew goes over and says, hey, listen, um, Jesus wants to look at your, your food. It's my food, sucker. What you talking about? Jesus wants my food. You know what my mama going to say if I said I, didn't, I was hungry because I gave my food to the disciples who said they were going to give it to Jesus? What? Listen here, boy. Don't make me call the Zebedee brothers. The sons of thunder. Look at them. And they're probably mean mugging him like, give him the food. I take it over to Jesus. He, he goes, this is all we can find, Jesus. See, there, this can't feed 20,000 people. Why is it the disciples always sound like hicks? This can't feed them. It ain't going to work, Jesus. And Jesus like, you simpletons. And and watch this. Before the miracle takes place, he says, go and tell the people. Have the people sit in certain groups, groups of 50, groups of whatever, align them and and get them in semicircles and and get them ready to eat. We only have this little kid's lunch and there ain't nothing else here. Are you willing to align and understand the miracle later? Or do you need to have every step laid out before you'll obey God? Before you you step out on faith. I'm not going to step out on faith until I know that I know that it's going to work. Can I get a guarantee that if I invest all this money, it's going to come back? Can I, can I get a guarantee that, 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 that like, you know, that this, that this if, if, I, if I go for this degree, I will get a job? No, we can guarantee a piece of paper and a lot of debt. Can you, can you guarantee that if, that, that if, I, if I trust this relationship that, that I've been praying for, that, that if, if I... <laughs> wants you to do what? The test is this. First one is doing it when you don't feel like it. Test. Second one is trust now and understand later test. Are you with me? Jesus is like, go out in the deep. Peter's like, master, we, we, we've told all night and took nothing. 
But I like big buts in the Bible. They cancel out your contradiction to what he's calling you to. But at your word, I will let down the nets. I don't know if Peter was like, yes, I'm going to obey. Or if he was like, but at your word, I will let down my nets. I hope the other guys aren't watching me right now because this is making me look really stupid. They helped me clean these nets. We were going home. The night was done. And here's Peter. Oh, they can see me. Dang it. The other, the other guy's are like, yo, yo, what are you doing? It took us several hours to clean those things. What was, nah. You're going to do that all by yourself. If you put those nets in the water, it's on you. Peter, shut up. The people are watching. I can't be rude. Puts out the nets. And when he had done this, when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. At this point, now they get all Yo, get the other boat. Isn't it funny how like, you know, when you're, when you're doing something out of obedience, the people who are like watching you are like, man, get some popcorn. This is going to be good when he fails. Oh, yeah, all your friends are haters. All your peers do not respect the call of God on your life. They don't. They're like, shh. God, God wants to use you? Are you serious? I, I, I had lunch with, with a friend of mine from, from Arizona today who used to have this joke. Gabriel, Paul, Gabriel and I used to have this joke. The joke was, you're a pastor? Do they know? Does God know your resume? Are you following me? When you're, when you're going into it, when you're walking out on faith, when you're, when, when you're putting yourself out there, when you're having the beginner's mind, the, the mind of a child to do something that looks childish because your mental data tells you it doesn't work that way. But when you're doing it anyway because God's called you to do it, it doesn't look good for the spectators. Nobody puts their attempt on Instagram. Nobody, they, they say nine out of ten businesses fail. Nobody puts the nine that failed before they get to the successful one. Are, are you with me? Is that landing? This is painful. But when you win, you're like, yo, bring the other boat. We're going to drown. It's going to sink if you don't co come quick. Zebedee's. It's thundering in here. signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink so that they began to sink but when Simon Peter saw when he saw it he fell down at his at, uh, at Jesus' knees saying depart from me for I am a sinful man O Lord for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. During the campaign trail, this election trail, my, my favorite moment of the campaign trail was when Joe Biden was with Barack Obama. And I think that they were speaking at a, at a, at a, at a gym or something. And somebody throw, you know, Barack Obama loves basketball, right? Now, no matter where you are politically, Barack Obama, coolest president ever, okay? Don't care what you, if you don't like his politics, at least you know that he can hoop, amen? 
They throw him a basketball, and he's just walking off cool like how Barack Obama is. He grabs it, and without even looking at the basketball hoop, just throws it up there, and it's nothing but net. And everyone's like, oh, POTUS! And Barack Obama goes, that's what I do. That's what I do. And Joe's behind him like, that's what he did. <laughs> that's what he did. When you catch a, 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 a catch like this of fish, it becomes very easy for people like Peter, for people like me, for people like herself, for people like Scott, people like Pastor RJ, people like Pauline to say, that's what I do. I know I look kind of crazy putting out my net, but I just knew something, something, I just felt something in my spirit saying, try it again. I just, had a, I just had a gut feeling that if I just did it again, I know it was unorthodox, but I've been a fisherman for so many years. You know, my daddy was a fisherman, my granddaddy was a fisherman, and we have fishermen all throughout my family. And there, there are certain things that you just get a, a feel about, the, about the, uh, the, the, the waters. Peter passes a test, and the test is the that's what I do test. That's what I do test. The way that he passes it is that he realizes I can't do what just happened. If it wasn't for the Lord working in my life out of never finished college, out of never started this business out of if it wasn't for the Lord working in our marriage there's nothing that could have changed this this stony heart of mine there if it wasn't for God intervening and coming through and showing up in this situation it, it, it was not going to work out the statistics were against me everything the the, the, the the horoscope come on somebody some of y'all be reading that was against me everything I tried did not seem as if it was going to work out in my life and he immediately drops to his knees and is like, I am a sinful man. There's nothing good about me that I've ever done to receive this blessing. You, only you, God, could have done this in my life. See, the problem with most of us, Ryan, is that we're trying to do it all by ourselves because we want to do the credit. We want to get the credit. We want to look cool. We want to have the Instagram picture like, yeah, Got my two RRs. Rest and relaxations for some of its Rolls Royces. Hello, somebody. I, I, I did this. And God's like, don't call me to do a job that you can do yourself. He's only interested and participating in things where he gets the glory. Perhaps, perhaps this year could be the year that you just step out into doing something that's kind of like, oh, if, when, when this comes together, when this, when this is just worked out, everyone's going to be dumbfounded, including myself. I will have no occasion or opportunity to boast. As a matter of fact, publicly, everyone will see the Pentecostal side of me. I will take off my hair extensions and everything. It's not gonna be nice. I know some of y'all be like, you know, before I worship, let me make sure the makeup's on. Yeah, I grew up in church, I know about church. You go to church, I'm like, you know, I praise and worship, I wanna be in the front row, lifting my hands, but not too high because my midriff will, if I go too high, He's looking for a praise where it gets, it just gets, it gets like David crazy where you just, you don't care what you're wearing. Like, I'm just going to dance before the Lord. I can't, I don't even have rhythm. I'm going to sing even though I'm tone deaf in every language. But they will know that that's what he did. It says that. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. 
And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, <clears throat> do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. I'll make you a fisher of men. I could spend a few hours just on that passage. I'll just drop this in you. This is the, the bigger picture versus my vision test. The big picture or my vision test. So let's say it together. The big picture or my vision test. <clears throat> the big vision <sighs> versus my vision test. The kingdom of heaven Jesus would start most of his parables always center around people doing small things and being rewarded with big things later. You may have heard it said, he who is faithful in little will be given much. I'd like to submit to you, my friends, that no matter how successful you are in life, whether it's in business, whether it's in education, whether it's in whatever it is that you've, you, you, that you've uh, applied your skills to, it is nothing but a minimum wage job in the kingdom of heaven. He's like, okay, I'm going to meet you at your vision. Your vision is to have a fishing enterprise. But I want to use your fishing enterprise as an illustration or a metaphor into my enterprise in the kingdom. You think that you'll have a paycheck if you catch a fish and feed your family and take care of your family and maybe build a legacy in a business that you can pass on to your children? Let me tell you something that's bigger than $25 an hour. It's called 25 souls for the kingdom or 25,000 souls for the kingdom. I want to use your illustration, your metaphor, your taking pictures. Let people see the glory of God's kingdom and not just your vision of taking a nice shot. Will you pass that test of, am I doing it for myself? Or can God expand and show me how this thing that I'm doing has eternal impact. Are you catching this, my friends? And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. <clears throat> when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. That's the final test. Are you willing to pass the leave it all for the Lord? My leader test. Where, we, where you catch his vision so much that now everything else really doesn't matter as long as you're lockstep in motion with him. The leave it all for my leader test. If Peter has said, Jesus, get out of my boat, you and I would have never heard of Peter. If Peter has said, man, we've been fishing all night. With all due respect, my family's waiting for me at home. I got to get home, Jesus, and I'm not going to play these games. You're a carpenter. You'd have never heard of Peter. Peter is showing you how to become like a child. I'm just going to listen to what you say. I'm not going to go on the algorithm of my GPS of how things work out. I'm just going to... But at your word, I'll do it. Doesn't make sense, but I'll do it. And the 
ultimate test. Are you willing, willing to leave the assets on the table and say, you know what? This doesn't matter. As long as I'm following him, that will be taken care of. Whew, I feel a preach coming on. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto me. And here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus is not a con man. He doesn't ask you to do something that he's never already done for you. The book of Philippians tells us that he was worshipped by a multitude of angels in heaven, wrapped in splendor, and he left it all on the table, disrobed himself of all glory, left it all to come find you. It's the gospel. Once you've experienced the gospel, are you willing to be the gospel for someone else? God has spoken to every one of us in different ways. He has spoken to us in our own spiritual language. There are places that he's challenged you in the last hour. And if you're willing to step out in faith with me and say, you know what? I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do it even though it doesn't make sense. I'm going to do something that will require that I don't get the credit, but only he gets the credit. If you're willing to be in that space where you're like, I, 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 it's, I'm in a space where I, I don't understand the logistics and the, the analytics don't make sense, but I'm going to trust anyways in this area of my life. And I'm going to leave it on the table and just follow God. If that's you, just stand up wherever you are boldly and say, today's my day that I go Harder than I've gone. He's nudging you. What do you do when the greatest opportunity gets in your boat uninterrupted, un uninvited, and interrupts everything about your program? God, you see the hearts, the heart position, the posture of all your people here. We let go of 2020's understanding and embrace the new thing. We let go of our understanding of what Republicans think to embrace the new so we can have relationships. We let go of what we think about Democrats. We let go of what we think about Trump voters. We let go of what we think about BLM people. We let go, we let go of it all. We let go of all our philosophies concerning career, relationships, our health. We let go of the, our understanding that exercise and, and, and watching our, our, our intake of food is, is a hard thing and we embrace that I can do it again. We let go of it all. God, I ask that you perform surgery and take out the microchips that lead us on the GPS path towards destruction in our life. Extract it from us, God. We can't do what you want to do in our lives if we are stuck on the old. Give us a new operating system. Give us your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God a great big hand of praise. Once again, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining the Relevant Church online experience. 
On behalf of Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Pauline, I'd like to tell you welcome home. Over this season, we had the opportunity to partner and serve with many local businesses. Check it out. There are many easy ways that you could partner with us today. You can give online at relevant316.com slash give. You can text your amount to 951-777-2028 and with Cash App and Venmo at Relevant Riverside. However you're partnering with us today, we just wanna say thank you. We would also like to invite you to join our Facebook group, Relevant Together. Relevant Together is where the heartbeat of our church happens. From regular connection to weekly content for the kids, everything is there. Type connect in the chat and we'll send you an invite. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week.